probably know if you watch me on the telly, I can't resist asking questions, but uh, often uh, at the Arctic Frontiers, the best questions come from you lot, so uh, it won't be too long before I ask you for your input as well. Uh, now, I should say we are joined on this panel by our four keynote speakers, and we have one uh, new member as well for you to meet. So do give a warm welcome to uh, Mike Sprager, who is director of the Wilson Center's Global Risk and Resilience Program and Polar Institute in the United States. So, Mike, a very warm welcome to you. There's a lot to get through, so uh, panel, I'm going to uh, ask all of us to be as concise as we can in our thoughts and our answers, because we've got a lot of ground to cover, given the nature of the keynote speeches and this idea that we want to get to grips with the state of the Arctic in 2020. Uh, Mike, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, Bobo Lowe has put out some pretty provocative ideas there, that the status quo will not hold in the Arctic, that this is a watershed moment where the geopolitics of the wider world is impacting in new and sometimes worrying and disturbing ways on the Arctic. And I guess there's no more sort of emblematic uh, sort of way of understanding that than looking at the last Arctic Council meeting where the United States in particular played a role which in the end made it, was impossi it, made it impossible for the eight nations to come up with a, a joint declaration uh, because the US was so concerned about, first of all, climate change being given too much uh, sort of... A coverage in, in the announcement, in the declaration, and also they were concerned about the role of China. So, from your point of view, where does the geopolitics of the world fit in understanding how the Arctic nations must adapt to this current world order? If you would start with just a small question and then work your way up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said be concise. No, no, I, I wasn't I concise, but you, you have to be. Uh, I think Bobo does raise uh, interesting uh, questions. I, I, I would have a different perspective on that. But to this point, I think it's important to understand where these different nations come from. I mean, Secretary Pompeo certainly underscored China, Russia, U.S. relations in the Arctic Council discussion. Mm. So aside from the fact that that discussion happened at the Arctic Council, something that had not been done before prior to an Arctic Council meeting, uh, let me give this following perspective. And I, I do believe that the Arctic now is a global Arctic. It's done. We're now, it's the emerging Arctic has emerged. But to understand, I think, what we need and how we go forward, you have to understand these nations. And to me, it's like a game, right? China plays the game, go long-term, decades-long strategy, Africa to the Arctic. That's China's perspective. In my perspective, Russia is playing the game survivor. Oil and gas development, a declining population, um, oligarch structure, not bad, but that's the game that's being played. And the United States globally plays the game twister. I mean, we've got one arm in the South China Sea, <laughs> one in the Indian Ocean, we've got one over here. I mean, we're, and now we have a new Arctic. Okay, that's a stretch of energy, time, money, navies, and so a new Arctic in this great game is an issue. So to me, that's how I frame this. I have You've planted it. an image in my head of Donald Trump back <laughs> in the White House, in the Oval Office, with I, his limbs all over the place. It's not a pleasant image. But I, I can't <laughs> unimage that now. <laughs> but, but to me, that, that's, that's what's pressuring the Arctic exceptionalism, the bubble that we all have thought about, the engagement that we've all had in this audience about the Arctic and these other issues have come up now, and they're pressuring the Arctic Council and these other structures. So I would say... Uh, to, to a new order, I don't know. What I would say is a supplement and an innovative next step for the Arctic Council, for the IMO, for UNCLOS. Strengthen these international orders mm. and perhaps not take that time to add another one on top of that, but strengthen those. But certainly the issues that he brings up are spot on, but it's from the perspective of those three power nations. Well, that, for, and, for and one that, that, that's what I want to pick up on, because essentially what you're saying is that the, the US, China, and Russia have very specific national interests that they are pursuing, more, arguably more aggressively than ever before in the Arctic. Where does that leave the smaller Arctic nation states? Uh, Minister Sarlady, you, you were relatively optimistic and positive in your presentation of where we're at in the Arctic and the achievements of the Arctic Council. But in the end, Washington, Beijing and Moscow, they don't give a hoot about the Arctic Council, really. Well, they do. 
they do. But but I would like to start by by saying that when, when I give a relatively optimistic view, it's also based on history and what we have achieved so far and what we have done through very difficult and challenging times in our recent history. We've managed to keep this an area based on uh, cooperation, on international law. And as I said in the beginning of my intervention, it's because we have put a lot of hard work into this. And I have no, um, th there is nothing to suggest that this is not going to continue because it is in the joint interest of all the countries, big and small. And one example, I, I would like to take issue with what you said about the US and the Arctic Council because I was there yeah. uh, and <laughs> participated in the negotiations. And yes, we disagreed on references to climate change in the document. Yes, it's the first time ever we didn't have a document after a ministerial meeting. And I think all of us were very disappointed by that. But what came out of it were then some things that makes me uh, very confident in the importance of the Arctic Council also for the US and for Russia. One thing is that we agreed on like 97% of the declaration aside from climate change. All the working groups that does the actual work also on climate change are continuing their work. And for the second time only in the history of the Arctic Council, all ministers were present. That also says something about attaching, um, attaching importance to it. So my, uh, or the, the policy that we are pursuing together also with all other Arctic states is that the framework that we have is actually uh, both viable but is also sufficient to cover what we have at the moment. I'm very uh, uneased by the idea that we should start making new treaties or, or new legal framework, because I don't think there is a need for it. And I think that what we have to continue to do is actually put a lot of emphasis into the cooperation that we have, as we did through the period of the Cold but, War, but as so, we did. Yeah, Minister, some might say that you're, you're refusing to accept new realities. And it's not just realities that might be derived from the you know, the aggressive sort of stance of, of the US government or the Chinese or the Russians, but even the French, and I'm going to put this to you, Minister, because you sit there as a minister in the European Union, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the French uh, foreign ministry uh, re recently released a paper in which they suggested that, and this is, runs entirely opposite to what you're saying, that the Arctic is a region beyond international law, and it could soon rival the Middle East as an area and arena of confrontation. That wasn't something coming from Beijing or Washington, that was coming from France. So even within the EU, there is a perception that the Arctic somehow lacks uh, international legal definition and could soon be an arena of conflict. Are they not listening to governments like Finland? Um, well, if we look at the, um, the history and the past, obviously since 1995, Finland has always emphasized the importance of Arctic and North and Northern dimension when it comes to European Union. And actually it's very positive that right during the, the Finnish EU presidency, we got further with, uh, with the Arctic uh, 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 opinions. And actually, it, it means that the EU will pay more attention for the Arctic in the future. And as I said earlier in my keynote, it, it will also mean further resources. But as in a trade policy, as in development policy or foreign and security policy, always obviously the European Union tries to find a mutual uh, unanimous understanding and opinion and then uh, uh, agree on things. But as I said, we hear different stories from France, we de hear different things from, from other countries, but obviously the most important thing is that we have the dialogue and then we have a platform like, like the Arctic Council, like this meeting today, mm. that we can share our thoughts as far as individual countries and the European Union. But also I'd like to emphasize the fact that if we look at the multilateral world order, if we look at the, the rules-based system, so obviously we see as Finland and also as, as the European Union that the rules-based system, yes, there are problems, there are crises, for instance, in the WTO, but we have to work on it and that's the work we do also as far as the United States, also as far as China and even Russia. I was in Moscow two, two weeks ago and the thing is that we have to look at the positive narratives. For instance, the black carbon is a good example. There are positive narratives and we cannot give up 
by just, say, by just saying that it doesn't work. And I think that's something, for instance, no Norway has le really paved the way, and, and also Finland tries to find the positive. Well, I, I understand. Yeah, happens. I understand positivity, but I also understand the importance of realism. Bobo Lo, do, do you? feel that the positivity that we get from the, the, the ministers of, of smaller Arctic nation states is realistic or is it ignoring actually the nature of geopolitics today? I know this is going to sound a bit sphinx-like, but it's a bit of both, really, because I think it's important to acknowledge the achievements of institutions like the Arctic Council. It's important to recognise the positive legacy of Arctic cooperation. What concerns me, though, is if we stand still and we just tinker at the edges, we will go backwards. Um, we, the world is changing. We cannot assume that what worked before, mm. and it certainly in many cases worked very well sure. indeed, that what worked before will invariably work for in the future. We need to be much more flexible. We need to be innovative. Now, as I mentioned in my remarks, that doesn't mean trashing existing mechanisms. It means building on them. But to assume that those existing mechanisms in and of themselves are sufficient, I think is delusional. Minister, I think you wanted to come in. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> because we are putting a, what I would call, very uh, realistic approach to our foreign policy and our Arctic policies. And we're doing two things. We are looking at the strategic picture that looks quite different now compared to five or ten years ago. And we have taken the consequence uh, by, for instance, in NATO now uh, having a new command structure, a new maritime posture, because we have to deal with the strategic implications of the high north becoming geostrategically and military strategically more, I would say, both interesting but also important. And that has to do mainly uh, with Russia's military buildup. Mm -hmm. So even though we don't consider it a direct direct threat to Norway, we see the strategic implications for NATO and the transatlantic um, issues. At the same time, we cannot give up on the structures of cooperation that are actually working today. And what we do know from international politics nowadays is that if something is working, please do not try to revise it or put it on the table and renegotiate it. On the contrary, what we have been able to do within the structures of the Arctic Council, as one example, is that the three legally binding agreements I mentioned, that is actually, I would say, filling out the cooperation that we have. And, and given the fact that we, on other issues, disagree strongly mm. with Russia, for instance, we are fully behind the restrictive measures of the EU when it comes to the illegal annexation of Crimea. Sure. We are still able to cooperate in an Arctic setting because we have common interests. So you think that notion of insulating the Arctic and Arctic cooperation from real problems and issues elsewhere in the world, that still works. The insulation principle it still not, applies, does it? Because I, I just wonder if it really does. It's not insulated, but it's manageable because we are dealing with issues of common interest in a different way because of these structures. And, and I mean, to the French point that you asked, Villa, mm. uh, it is positively wrong. I mean... It is, it is absolutely nothing to suggest, on the contrary, that the Arctic is beyond international law. So what did you say to your French counterpart when he came exactly, out with that Exactly idea? that. <laughs> and, and, and in his best French, what did he say to you? Yeah. Well, I've, I've known Shani for, for many, many years because we were defense ministers together as well. But I mean, this... Yeah, but that's not an answer. No, no, no. But, uh, that's, I'm sure I'm, you're great friends, but what did he... You know, th th there is a, a fundamental point here. You know, what, why our You yeah. would say his perception is entirely wrong. Yeah. And he doesn't understand the Arctic. But if we're all agreed that the Arctic is becoming much more uh, of a global issue, it really matters that Paris doesn't understand and no. has got the really wrong, in your view, a really wrong perception of what's going not on in the Arctic. In my, it's not my personal view. No, I but, have to say. But, it's but the point is, uh, this, this dysfunction really matters, and it's really that's, worrying. That's why we're also spending a lot of time with the EU and EU countries to talk about this. We were very happy to cooperate with the Finnish presidency of the EU half a year ago on these issues, because when the EU is now carving out a new Arctic strategy, we have to be 
very focused on working together with the EU to make sure that we're doing this based on knowledge and international law. Right. Well, I'm going to. I'm just going to call it. But we'll hold that thought because I'm going to just pause for a second. I'm very aware that in this state of the Arctic uh, discussion, we also want to get into the, the climate change issues as well, not least because Matthew's sitting here and he's got lots of interesting things to say. But before we even do that, I just want to take this opportunity to invite <coughs> the first twitch of a hand or the raise of an elbow <laughs> to indicate that people have got a question. And I'm very much this year minded to take questions from the back as well as the front because I failed miserably sometimes to spot everybody <laughs> last year. So I can see a raised arm at the front and I will come to you, but uh, I'm just wondering if there's anybody who wants to put a question at this point or raise a thought from the back. So, sir, you, you win the prize of the first question. So let's get a microphone to you, sir. Uh, Mike is coming. Thank you for standing up. M Mike, uh, Mike Rosslers, there you go. There's a microphone. Hi. Uh, Salam. Yeah, keep, hold the mic as close as you can yes. to your... Yeah. Uh, Julian Mead from the uh, U.S. Uh, my question is for, for anyone on the panel. We're talking about uh, you know cooperation and conflict. Mm. What role do you all see the Northern Sea Route, Northeast Passage, mm. playing in the direction that the Arctic goes? Further cooperation, competition, conflict. Yeah. Uh, as the ice melts and it becomes more viable. Yeah. Great question. Actually, yeah. the Northern Sea Route, which you know we've talked about Russia and its agenda in the Arctic, and the Russians appear to want to control that Northern Sea Route in ways that other Arctic nations find disturbing. Mike, is this something that you you want to take on? I, I, yeah. It's, it's obvious that you know look at the activity along the, the, the Northern Sea Route. I mean, if you want to look at the internationalization of of the Arctic, look no further than the Northern Sea Route. Direct investment from China. Uh, massive builds up at oil and gas mm. productivity. We've got uh, Chinese markets open, mm. Asian markets open, uh, oil tankers or oil re ice reinforced oil tankers built in the shipyards of South Korea, financed by other nations. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is the new Arctic. So yes, it is literally redefining the way in which we view the Arctic. Because even though it was an energy rich place before, now because of sea ice melt, that that whole area is more accessible. So it's not just defining the energy, redefining the energy equation. It's supplemented President Putin's economy significantly. Sure. It's also shaped the geopolitics. But other parts of the Arctic, you know, too, do the same thing. But my question is, will, will Minister Soraida's um, <clears throat> optimism that the, the, the current institutions, traditions of cooperation and collaboration in the Arctic will ensure proper management of the Northern Sea Route and its various sort of legal and logistical implications, yes, will that hold or not? Yes, I think it will. However, it's going to be up to the other nations to make sure it holds. Mm. I mean, there, there are, of course, but there are, there are international rules and regulations that all these nations are abiding by. It's up to the other nations to keep that, like any other jurisdiction, to keep uh, Russia. Uh, we also have to build alternatives to that as well. I mean, the other shipping routes, other shipping industries, other, other assets should be built in, in the north. Um, you know, my own state of Alaska has a lot to say about energy equations and what they would like to do in the north as well. So I think the order is there, the rules and regulations are there, but it's up to the nations to keep each country in check or in balance or following by the rules. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to take, a, rather than get everybody to respond to every question, I'm going to take more, a couple more questions at this point. So you, sir, uh, yes, you, yep, uh, thank you for standing up. We'll get you a microphone. Thank you. I'm Turkel Peterson, uh, Arctic expert in the European Union. I just wanted to throw in a different angle. I mean, there's a lot of talk about climate change, the Northern Sea Route and these things, but could I draw your attention to demographics? Mm -hmm. One of the things that at least I'm struggling with personally is, will it half? Will it be stable, four to five million in the circumpolar area? Yes. Or will it double or triple? And that will change the dynamics of the region, but not because of climate change only, not because of security problems, hard security, but it will simply change the dynamics of who lives there, how many schools, how many telephone lines are yes. there, shops and these things. And I think that's a real challenge for the Finnish minister, for the Norwegian minister, for the Russian minister. Just to give an example about what demographics means, in the BML Peninsula, I understand that the area where Sabeta now lies, had maybe 7,000 
inhabitants uh, two decades ago. Now there are 40,000, if I'm well informed, the Russians will be able to correct me. But how will that play out in the northern part of Canada, for instance, and in northern Norway? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a, it's a great point. And if we are talking about the state of the Arctic and trying to assess where it is in 2020 and where it's going, demographics has to be a big part of it. So, Minister Scanari, uh, is the Finnish perspective that you want substantially more people to live in the Arctic? Obviously, you've got your own small portion of the Arctic, but generally, is that the vision, that the Arctic needs people, more people? Well, it's, a, it's one of the major questions, and of course, for, also for our government and, and for Lapland, for, for, for Northern Finland, <coughs> but also for our Nordic and global friends when it comes to Arctic. I'd say that if we look at the digitalization, for instance, we are emphasizing a lot on resources when it comes to digitalization. We also see the uh, positive uh, development of, for instance, the Northern Sea Cable, things like that. So the emphasis is also in the north, not just in the capital, in the south. So in other words, we also see the importance of education, know-how, and the universities. I see Tromsa is a great example that you can have the very top, the very uh, top uh, research and development know-how in northern Norway. And so is Finland, Rovaniemi, for instance. So I think we really have to look at our Iceland, Akure, if you look at 30,000 people. More people are moving there Partly it's because about, of the yes. education. So I think it's, 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 it's in the very core of our politics that how we see the future of education, investments, but also to logistics, accessibility, everything. So I think it's also for the European Union now when we renew the Arctic conclusion. So thank you for the question. And partly I, it seems to me it's about uh, giving real meaningful autonomy to the regions in the Arctic to give them a, a sense that they can drive their own destiny and also develop regional cooperation between Arctic regions that don't necessarily have to go through the capital city, which oftentimes might be far to the south. Is that something that Norway buys into? Well, absolutely, when it comes to uh, to creating regional cooperation between the Arctic states. And we have many, many good examples. Uh, of course, of course um, the Arctic Council with all its smaller cooperations as well. But we have, uh, as we're now chairing the Barrow, Barents uh, Euro-Arctic Council, um, with all its regional uh, perspectives, but also the people-to-people -people cooperation that we have across border. That is really maybe some of the most, I would say, um, under-communicated success stories of the cooperation. Uh, in the Arctic is how we have been able to cross borders, solve many of the issues before they become political issues in a way, because we, we focus so much resources, energy, uh, and, and also, um, I would say, financial support to the people-to-people -people contact in all the Arctic countries. Um, and we see it, of course, especially among the Nordic countries and Russia because of our geography. That has been, in my opinion, also a very, very important part of developing uh, the Arctic. And, and it goes without saying, and I think our opening uh, speech has also made this point, that, you know, that, that the young people of the far north have to be given uh, a sense that there is a real future for them in, in the, staying in the far north. So at this point, I want to bring in two perspectives. We have this idea that this year we're going to bring uh, sort of perspectives from inside the audience of people we know have got interesting things to say. So I'm going to ask at this point for uh, two of the Arctic frontiers emerging leaders who are on the program for emerging leaders this year, just to give us a very quick perspective from their point of view, and this obviously coming from young people, I'm going to invite Kim Mathieu from the University of Ottawa and Solfried Henriksen from uh, CERMAC uh, in, in Norway to give us their perspectives as they are emerging young leaders in the Arctic. Over to you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, bonjour, mon nom est Kim Mathieu et je suis Canadienne. Hello, my name is Kim Mathieu and I am Canadian. Youth are currently leading the climate movement, yet we still have to fight to get a seat at the table. We have learned to expect nothing but business as usual from our leaders. I have hope that this will change. Young people need to be a partner in the discussion on their future, and you can't do it without us. We must learn to better collaborate to address the climate emergency. To do this, we must recognize and value scientific knowledge alongside indigenous knowledge and youth-based knowledge. Give us a seat at the table. 
with our indigenous colleagues. This isn't a photo op to us. You need to listen with respect. Give us a seat at the table. I'm an emerging leader. I will be here for the rest of your career. <laughs> I will witness your actions, and I will witness your inactions. Yeah, true. You cannot write our future without us there. Please. How will you collaborate with youth to address the climate emergency? Hi, I'm Solfred. I grew up in Lofoten, and I knew from the very first beginning that I wanted to stay in the Arctic and to live in the Arctic. I'm very lucky. I have a master's degree in biology, and I get to work for an aquaculture company in the North Norway that invests in the local communities and make it possible for me to utilize my education here in the Arctic. The ocean is of great value for the whole world, but we do only produce 2% of the food for human consumption in this element that actually makes up 70% of the globe. And the Arctic needs to be the leader of sustainable food production and sustainable management of resources, which means we need knowledge here. We need people to take education and have the opportunity to get a good and relevant job here in the rural areas. And we also must make it a good and safe life for them here. One of the biggest challenges is actually the infrastructure. We need infrastructure that serves the companies and that serves the people. We must encourage and make it easier for companies to develop their business in a sustainable way. And we must create important and relevant jobs for the people who's going to live here. And if we do so, we will be able to attract and keep the youth in the Arctic. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Kim and Salford, thank you so much for that contribution and delivered with a great deal of passion, or, or almost, uh, 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 well, certainly food for thought. I think it's fair to say that for, for everybody on this panel. Matthew, I want to bring you in because the focus of our emerging leaders was very much on sustainability, on climate change, and listening to young people's voices for whom this is, as they said, not just some sort of photo opportunity. This is real, and this is about their lives and their futures. When you look at this as, a, as, a, as an expert climate scientist, and you, you ran through some of the basic sort of data of what's happening in the Arctic, do you fear, when you hear things like the Americans refusing to have any reference to climate change put in the, uh, you know, the, the, the declaration that never was of the last Arctic Council, do you fear that the, the leaders of the great powers simply don't get it? Um, well, I, I perhaps shouldn't be commenting too much on geopolitics as a, as a scientist, but I, I think perhaps to say that the young people of the world have got it, right? So these, these guys are the future. Um, the one thing I will say, uh, and you know, the Paris Agreement was a great recognition of climate change as being a, a, a global problem, uh, and you know, a great recognition of the science that we've done uh, to, to prove to the world that it's a global problem. Um, the challenge of meeting 1.5 degrees uh, of warming is vast. Um, it we're, already... we're failing to meet it, aren't we? Uh, well, we're already, already at about one uh, uh, degree. You know, the, 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 the rate of reduction of emissions is, is um, going to be a, a, a challenge which probably involves technology which has not even been invented. But am I right in thinking that year on year at the moment, emissions are still rising? We're yes. Not, we're not reducing at all yet. No. And, and do we have a, a putative date when we might see that curve start to go downward? Or, or is that even not possible to speculate? Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to speculate as, as, a, as a scientist. Well, but as a scientist, you're allowed to project on what the data is telling you. 
Yeah, so the data is telling me that there's very much still a rise, really, year on year. And, and this idea, I mean, I can't do science without graphs, but the, 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 if you look at the rate of growth of emissions and the kind of cliff that we've got to fall off in mm. order to get, and even to go negative, which is a kind of interesting, so to remove CO2 somehow from the, from the system. Um, right. Now, as a scientist, I suspect you, again, might be wary of answering this question, but it seems to me very relevant to this panel. Over the next coming two days, we're going to talk about that, that incredibly important balance of continuing to develop the North, the Arctic region, so that young people have jobs, so that people can continue to believe their futures, their lives can, you know, uh, have full potential in, in the Arctic region, at the same time as respecting the need to get real about the need to cut emissions and to live in very different ways. Can the far north uh, continue with its, its um, hopes for economic development in terms of mineral extraction, fossil fuel extraction, the development of infrastructure, new roads, airports, and all of that? Can it do that, in your opinion, and stay true to notions of sustainability and respecting the science? Um, I, I suspect it can, because this is a... This is something which is, well, it's not that it's not happened before, but this is a new opportunity to, dr to drive that sustainable uh, agenda, to adopt new technologies uh, and, and to do things in a different way. Uh, I think if we continue in our old ways, then we're just going to um, you know, extract all that oil uh, mm. and, and burn it. Uh, and there's, and if I would just follow up on that, there's, there's two things that give me hope, kind of like an Arctic Pollyanna here for a moment. Mm. What the heck? Uh, <laughs> in that, and that is this whole issue of, of knowledge, right? Two things that give me great hope. Young leaders. Mm -hmm. I mean, they got it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they're, they're iPhone in a way, and they, they've got, and they know the future that they want, and they see the one that's coming. They don't like the one that's coming. They see the one they want. That's very helpful. I think it's our collective jobs to make to help them along. Sure, because the thing is, they're not in power yet. I'm yes. sure one day they yeah, will be, but, but, but make sure. some of us here on this panel, not right. me, but some of us on this panel have power right now. Yes. And, the, yeah. and we need to help enable. The second is, you know, industry is not the villain here. I mean, I believe that in industry and innovation and knowledge and youth, thinking outside the boxes, not just will save the Arctic, but I think also the globe. So there's a way to provide innovative educational technology and opportunities. There's innovations to help youth and leadership. There's also ways to let industry lead. Industry will go there. They'll go where the dollar is. Right now, I think there's a lot of money to be made. It will be time. But the North could be a model for how you do it. Again, a lot of these issues come from outside the North. They concentrate in the North, and we see the results. But providing the industry an opportunity to grow, foster, and innovate in incubators called the Arctic seems like two really good things to me, the youth mm. equation and the innovation equation. OK. Well, we like Pollyannas at times, because uh, positivity is really important. <laughs> I'm going to get you to say what you want to say, and then I'm going to go back to our audience. So be quick. I was just about to say that far north is, is far more than just tourism. It's not like just having Caribbean or Mer Mediterranean region to travel for, but it's also innovation. It's, it's, a, it's a huge platform to scale new things, experience, and that's what we have learned from Finland, I think, with our Nordic friends, with Canada, mm -hmm. with our partners, and I think that is the greatest potential also for research and development and businesses, and that's something we have to explore. Mm. Okay. I, I can see there are eager hands up, so I want to get back to our audience. Uh, you, sir, you've been very patient, so um, I don't know if you have a mic near you. Yes, let's get you a microphone. Thank you very much. My name is Martin. I'm a journalist. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lowe, uh, for bringing up the uh, idea of a global treaty on the Arctic. Uh, at least it is a wonderful way of highlighting the increased global significance of the Arctic. But I wonder, is this only an academic exercise? Mm. As you know better, the Arctic nations, the EU, all of them, has rejected and not discussed this idea for the last 10 years at least. Yeah. Um, they have rejected it for, for very clear reasons. The minister was very clear mm. in her rejection, and you know all of this. Mm. Um, so my question is, is this an academic exercise, clever as it is, uh, or do you have indications to indicate that there is any change in any capital relevant for this discussion on this issue. 
Bobo? Um, I want to answer that question just very quickly in a, a slightly roundabout way by saying that one of the reasons why the Arctic has enjoyed such success in regional cooperation is that for much of the past few decades, it's taken place against the background of a more or less predictable, larger international environment. So although there was the Cold War, there were certain rules, there were rules of engagement, kind of people knew where things stood. Now, I believe that Arctic, a regional order in the Arctic benefited from this. Today, the setting is so much more fluid and unpredictable. And so that has implications for uh, regional order. Therefore, we need to look at other mechanisms. Now, I come back, come back to Minister Soredi. Quite right to maintain, even expand, existing mechanisms. In no way am I suggesting we should trash them. All I'm saying is that it's not, these are not adequate for the time looking ahead. And so coming directly to your question, of course today, it, it, it seems impossible, doesn't it? You know, it seems a mere academic exercise. But then we think about sort of the extraordinary processes that led to the Helsinki Accords. What looks completely fantastic in one era becomes the reality or can become the reality of the next era. And we need to look ahead. Just because something is difficult, looks impossible. Of course, we, it's very easy to identify thousands of obstacles, thousands of problems. But staying still is not an option. All right, I'm going to, Bobo, you put that work. so well. I'm going to go very quickly, almost a yes or no, but do you buy that? <laughs> <laughs> You're on hard talk now, right? That's what you're, um... Well, you're going to have to be quick because we're yes, running I'm, out of time. Yes, I'm, I'm going to be very quick. But, but I would like to kind of turn your idea upside down and to say that if the situation is, as you suggest, that international cooperation is getting more and more difficult, uh, there is no need for multi or no appetite for multilateralism, uh, the strategic challenges are getting greater, what are the, I would say, the the chances of if one would agree to do such a thing, the chances of anyone getting this in a better manner than we have today. And what is, and just <laughs> let me finish yes. this one, because if, if we look at the situation today, we have no significant territorial disputes. There are no sovereignty that are disputed or, or there is no country that, that lacks sovereignty at all. So why is there a need to re- visit these discussions because everything is actually clear and clarified through international law. I, I would say briefly, there is, a, there is a one elephant in the room, or rather it's not in the room, military and security arrangements, confidence building measures. Now, you mention uh, the enhanced presence of NATO in the Arctic. I think that's an important step. But it's inadequate. It's not enough. We need to be looking. The situation is changing. We need, in, we need to maintain and expand our existing mechanisms, but we need to look beyond. Because the world is changing so rapidly that what worked in the past is unlikely to work in the future. Fascinating discussion and, and leaves many questions on my mind and I doubtless on your minds too because I know there are hands twitching and more people want to get involved in this debate. Sadly, such is the tyranny of time and the flashing red light on my screen that you guys can't see but it's intimidating me. Uh, it means, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that we're going to have to draw this debate to a close for now. There's going to be lots more discussion but the good news uh, is that right now we're going to, I think, have about 25 minutes it's for coffee break. So refuel yourselves, come back energized, and uh, as you go out, please give the warmest of thank yous to our wonderful panel. Thank you all very much indeed.